2 Timothy chapter 4. Are you ready for the battle? One of the great lessons God has been teaching those of us who are believers in this last year is that we should not get too comfortable in this world in which we live. I think all of us have been too comfortable. I really believe that. The Lord wants us to calibrate our lives and thoughts to eternal values, not the here and now. He does not want us to be thinking of the temporary. He wants us to be thinking more on the eternal, making the choices that we make in life based on eternal values, things that are going to matter for all eternity. Because after all, folks, if you're a believer, that's where you're going to spend the rest of your days or existence is with the Lord in eternity. This is so important. You see, there is a war going on. We can't see it necessarily with our eyes, but we can know the, the war that is going on because of, of, of what the Bible tells us. It's a spiritual war. It's, it's, it's a world that is being waged, um, not visibly, but we can see the results of it. It's a spiritual one, and you are in the battle, whether you realize it or not, whether you want to be in it or not. Listen, I get it. We live in America. Oh, I don't want to be in it. I just want to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to buy some property, build a, build a little house on there and unplug from the world and everything's going to be great. Well, let me say this. If you're a, a saved person, if you're a believer, you are still in the battle. And can I tell you this? You may go hide in the woods, but the devil's not going to leave, leave you alone. And by the way, the Holy Spirit's not going to leave you alone either. God wants you engaged. God wants you to be a part. God wants you to be in the battle. God wants you to be ready for the battle. Now, our theme in this study has been standing strong in the last days. And as the world moves more and more towards evil and towards chaos, living for Christ is going to be more and more challenging, just the way it is. Get ready for that. Be ready. Be prepared. Don't get, don't get scared, but be prepared, okay? Our God is a mighty God. He is almighty God, okay? And he's going to be with us as we go through this. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6, here's Paul. Of course, this is shortly before he died. He says, for I am now ready to be offered the time of my departure is at hand. He's not talking about taking Allegiant Airline from uh, Punta Gorda to St. Cloud. He's talking about going to heaven. He's going to be martyred. He says, I have finished, or I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Paul writing to Timothy, saying, look, would you please come soon to see me? For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. He defected. Demas had been a faithful believer who defected, fell in love with the world instead of continuing to fall in love with Jesus. Something got in the way that got him distracted. It may have been, uh, he may have been weary. Uh, it may have been a person. It may have been a, an idea or whatever, but something took him away. He, he uh, turned his eyes away from Jesus and turned his eyes onto the world, fell in love with the world, defected from the faith. This is a faithful missionary, still a believer, doesn't say he lost his salvation or he wasn't saved. No, he's still saved, but he defected. Having loved this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus to Demo, uh, Dal Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. We talked about Luke last time, the physician, the writer of 27 to 28% of the New Testament. 
Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for ministry. John Mark, who also wrote the Gospel of Mark, uh, this great believer who started out shy, started out scared, started out not um, being what he should have been, but he's, he got his life together and he came back and started faithfully serving the Lord with his life. And Paul said, he's become a valuable asset. Valuable. Take Mark, bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for ministry. Now you might say, for the ministry, okay, uh, there's no question as to what Paul's ministry was. I want you to see this with your own eyes. I hope you have your Bible with you. You can see it on the screen, but there's something about turning the pages, uh, okay? I know, or tapping the screen, whatever you want to do. Uh, look with me to Acts chapter 20. My dear friend, uh, Dr. Rod Holler, who's a, a son, or a father-in-law to our daughter Kim, uh, he's the pastor of Cape Baptist Church down in Cape Coral. Uh, he uses an iPad as well, but he has had over the years, uh, I think several times where his iPad has, has not worked properly, and so he's had to convert to uh, uh, one of the uh, services we were down there. He had a paper notebook, okay, and he was using to preach from paper. What a foreign concept that is. <laughs> um, I've thought, I've thought before about it, but I, I will say this, okay? Free advertising, Apple. I know some people hate Apple. I get it. Uh, but let me tell you, if you hate Apple and you love Google, you've really got a problem. <laughs> um, uh, but anyways, I know I'm going to get emails on that. Anyways, I have, I, I have had an iPad and used it for preaching since the iPad 2. And I've never had it one time lock up on me the different ones I've had, never once. I know some of you have, have not been so fortunate. But, um, but anyways, you might say, what would you do? What would you do? i just dismiss church. No, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Hopefully I know when I'm preaching well enough to keep going and not uh, sweat, okay? I wouldn't sweat. Um, but anyways, no, uh, they can be a delightful device, but there's nothing wrong with paper. And, uh, and that works, too, and, and who knows what the future holds with that, right? Um, you know, it won't be long till you can't use paper anyway, right? Because it'll, it'll have some environmental impact, and, and uh, somebody will freak out. So you have to, you know, I mean, we have to go embrace the trees. Just go love them. Give, just, after church today, just go give a tree a hug, okay? I mean, come on. <laughs> Just do it. Yeah. Acts chapter 20. Seriously, though. The Apostle Paul. What was his ministry? You know what? He never flinched. From the day he got saved, he never flinched. He never turned away. I want to show that to you. Acts chapter 20. This is, this is down the road in his ministry. He says, he was being told, listen, there's danger up ahead for you. You keep going, your ministry, you keep going in the direction you're going, you're going to run into trouble. Not that he hadn't already had it, but it said in Acts 20, 24, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Isn't it interesting? And in 2 Timothy 4, he says, I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Here in Acts 20, he said, I, I, I'm gonna, I want to finish my course with joy. Okay? What specifically was that? Well, let me take you over to chapter 26 of Acts. Go to Acts chapter 26. When, G, when Paul got saved, this was spoken to him by Jesus. Jesus is the one who said this. And, and the Lord was telling Paul about what he wanted his life to be and what the purpose of his life was. And it says in Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins 
and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. You notice how you're saved? You're saved, Jesus said, by faith in him. That's how you're saved. It's how you get to heaven. That's how you receive eternal life. Forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. This was told Paul when he first got saved. Paul reiterated the purpose of his ministry in Acts chapter 20. Then we see in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, I've run my race, I've kept the faith, I've finished my course. I've finished my course. Now, folks, why do I cover that? Simply this. It is not accidental that these passages are in the Bible. God is speaking to you and to me. They are for us. God has preserved his word so his children and the world can benefit from what he has written. Okay? These scriptures are there. Our ministry should be the same as was the, the Apostles Paul. You may not have a formal ministry of like a traveling evangelist or something like that, but God wants all of his children to be engaged in evangelism, sharing the gospel. You might say, I don't know what to say. Then bring them to church. Get them to go online, whether it's radio, whether it's internet, whatever it is. But getting the word out, sharing the gospel, letting people know, uh, uh, and letting them know more than once because sometimes they don't want to listen the first time or they don't understand it the first time. It's your ministry. It's my ministry. God holds us accountable. Okay? I am amazed at how many Christians... You know, they, 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 talk, they talk like crazy. They talk like crazy. But when it comes to talking for, for, or sharing the gospel, it's like all of a sudden, frozen at the mouth, like an Arctic river. What happened? It's a spiritual war. That's what's happened. The only way you can account for the fear is there's a spiritual war. We are being resisted. Satan doesn't want us to open our mouths. He doesn't want us to take a stand. He doesn't want us to proclaim the word. He doesn't want us to invest in missions. He doesn't want us to support local church. He doesn't even want you in church. He doesn't want you to learn the word of God. Why? He wants you to get sidetracked. Satan wants to wreck your life. He wants to wreck your testimony. Wants to wreck your marriage. Wants to wreck your family. He is the home wrecker. He is the life wrecker. And if you're saved, he's got a target on your back. But the marching orders have never changed. The goal is to testify or to, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So what we see here, we see number one today as we're going through this in verses 9 through 13, just kind of a simple outline today. Soldiers engaged in the battle. There are soldiers referred to here engaged in the battle. Uh, verse 12, uh, Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. Now, here's an interesting character in the Bible. You might say, uh, interesting character, I can't even hardly pronounce his name. We'll just, we'll just pretend that I'm saying it right, okay? Um, what was he? He was a gopher. Not Minnesota, by the way. He was a gopher for the Apostle Paul. That's what he was. That's his ministry. You might say, well, that's not very significant. I mean, he's not real high profile. No, but you know what? He helped Paul accomplish the great work Paul was accomplishing. Folks, listen, these folks are never in the spotlight, but they are invaluable to the work of God. The work of God could not continue if it wasn't for them. Uh, you know, people, we get a lot of, a lot of viewers and, and listeners to their ministry and, and, and so forth. I want you to know right now, it's, it's, it's church. It's, it's not me. This church is all of us together, working together, okay, orchestrated together for a common purpose, a common reason, and we need to work together regardless of what your responsibility may be. All of us can do something, and we need to be engaged in doing that and trying to reach others for Christ. And that is the beauty 
of the work of God. Okay? And ultimately, who gets the glory? God does. It's His church. And that's the way it should be. These folks are invaluable. The work of God should involve every believer in every capacity and place. Everyone is important and necessary. You know what I love? We've got people from all walks of life in our church in all ages. What I love is we come together. We're the family of God. We're the, we're the church of Jesus Christ. It doesn't, I don't care if you're an executive or you work at McDonald's or you pick up trash in a parking lot. Do it for the glory of God and let's live for Jesus Christ. This is what it's about. This is what it's about. Those aren't just words. I mean that with all my heart. I know what it, I know what it is to, to do that. One job I had uh, one summer I worked uh, when I was doing youth ministry, and I worked down where I transferred, uh, worked down to work closer to where our, our kids were that we were working with. And I was a stockman in a grocery store. But before the store opened in the morning, I had the privilege of driving this gigantic machine. It was sort of like a, um, now what's the, the Italian sounding machine that they have at hockey rinks? Zamboni. Zamboni. Don't you just love that word? <laughs> you feel like you just go in, I'd like a large Zamboni to go, you know. <laughs> Anyways, it was, this, it was this big machine though, and what it is, I, I drove it around, the, the store owned the parking lot. Now, there are a lot of different stores there, but the, the store, the, the public supermarket that I worked at, it owned the parking lot. And I drove this around. I started work at 6 in the morning, and I drove this thing around, okay? I don't know if I had graduated at that point, but was close to graduation. And it would just basically, it was a big vacuum in the parking lot. But there were certain things I wasn't allowed to pick up with the machine. And one of them was dirty diapers. <laughs> yes, dirty diapers. So I had to do those by hand. And so and then there was a part of my vehicle where I had to, to put those. But um, now why am I sharing that with you? Listen, folks, that's the dirtiest job I ever had. Well, I did, I did do pest control at one point, and that wasn't the greatest thing. If bugs make your skin crawl and you want your skin to crawl, come talk to me. That was an interesting job. But you know what? Even that, lots of opportunities to share the gospel. The fish you're biting if you throw your line in. Okay? These are soldiers engaged in the battle. Tychicus. Who knows about Tychicus? Not a lot is said about him, but everybody's important and necessary. Verse 13, the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus. Okay? When thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. Interesting. The books were papyrus scrolls, or rolls, excuse me. While we don't know for sure, the parchments could possibly have been some of his epistles. We don't know one way or another, as well as the Old Testament scriptures. We're not totally sure. It's just that they're mentioned here, but that's a possibility. If it did contain some of Paul's writings or it did contain the Old Testament scriptures, I find it interesting that here is Paul at the very end of his life still learning the Word of God. Isn't that amazing? I mean, he's just the great apostle. Look at how much of the Bible he wrote, how rich God used him to write down the scriptures, and he was still learning. You know, I know there, there are some preachers who, as they, they, they go through uh, ministry and as they get older, they quit learning with the enthusiasm that they did when they were younger. You know, they, they just go back to their notes that they had and they're not discovering new things. Oh, that's pathetic. There are new things to be learned and, and applied and be blessed with in Scripture, regardless of your age as a Christian. Here is Paul at the end of his life still learning. And why not? Doesn't the Bible introduce us to, as he mentioned, he, he had a name for it, Paul, the unsearchable riches of Christ? You'll never get to the bottom of it. Verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith 
did me much evil, the Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. Alexander was someone who evidently got into false doctrine. I don't know if he started there. I know there is an Alexander in the book of Acts. We don't know for sure if it was the same person. But here's the point. This man had gotten into and been influenced and, and basically had his mind uh, overtaken by error. And he became an enemy of Paul and an enemy of the cross of Christ. He became one so strongly opposed to the Apostle Paul that he set out to cause him trouble. You might say, are there people really like that? Yes, they are, folks. And, and let me tell you, there are Christians like that. Christians can be some of the most nasty, mean-spirited, despicable, awful people on the planet. Now, I know that rubs some people's theology the wrong way, but you're not being honest. Yes, I wish every Christian was a spiritual, godly believer who's walking with the Lord and is sweet-spirited and is being a blessing to others and serving the Lord. But the truth of it is there are some Christians who don't want to live for Christ. They're living for the world. And, if, if, uh, it, and when you as a godly believer are around them, you are a conviction to them. You make them feel guilty. And so they'll lash out on you or backstab you or talk about you on social media and so forth or on the phone. Might say, are, are they really saved? They're saved people who do that. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. And let me tell you, there's a lot of preachers who leave the ministry because they can't take it anymore of how many people they have in their church that are that way. There will be opposition when you serve Christ. Verse 16, at my first answer or defense, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Wow. Wow. This great man who had been so faithful, who had done so much for the cause of Christ, at his first defense in front of the Roman court, there was nobody there to defend him. I love this, though. But all men forsook me. I pray, God, that it may not be laid to their charge. Lord, have mercy on them. See, Paul understood the pressures of ministry and the pressures of being a godly Christian in the days in which we live, which were days of intense persecution. Verse 17, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. So we've seen some of the Soldiers engaged in the battle here with Paul. But secondly, we see the source of victory in the battle. In verses 17 through 22, the apostle was faithful unto death. He stood when no one stood with him. He stood strong until the day of he, that he died, until the day of his death. Can we? Yes. We can do the same. Why? Or better yet, how? Okay, it is by faith. It is by depending upon the Lord and obeying his word. This is the key to the Christian life. We sing the great hymn. Boy, I'm talking about hymns today. I've got two more to share with you. But we sing the great hymn, Trust and Obey. What a beautiful, perfect hymn. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That's the Christian life. We trust in the Lord, then we obey his word. This is what Paul did, and we can do the same. And as we go, we must claim his promises. Claim his promises. Folks, that will keep us from falling away. That will keep us from being discouraged. That will keep us from quitting, okay? But from becoming a demas. Claim the promises. Believe what the Bible says. You might say, well, I'm good as long as I'm reading it, and then when I close my Bible an hour later, I'm fretting again, and I'm all frazzled once again. Then get back into it. 
Put the Bible on your phone or on three by five cards or do something to where you can keep bringing that up, keep bringing it up. Well, that's, that's just kind of strange. <laughs> Listen, it wouldn't be strange if more Christians would do it. Instead, we just fret. And the ones who take it seriously and do that, we think, oh, that person, they're always, they're always reading, they're always memorizing, they got their three by five cards, they got it on their phone and all. This is a weirdo. Man, man, you need Jesus. Jesus is a crutch in your life. Yeah, you're, you're right. What's your crutch? You've got something you're, you're leaning on. Maybe it's drugs. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's some perverted behavior. Listen, folks, we are defective, needy people. That's why we need a Savior. There's nothing shameful about it. There's something wonderful about it. Okay? Paul saw it. This is exactly what he's talking about here in our text. Claim the promises as we engage in the spiritual war we are in. There are four, in this passage, four important promises in these last verses, to keep in mind. These are four promises to help us stand strong in the last days and keep going. And you notice the first one, we find it in verse 17, the Lord will go with us. The Lord will go with us. We go, we get afraid. Man, I'm scared. Man, I, yeah, no, wait a minute. The Lord does not take us and say, okay, he push us out there and say, good luck. No. He says, take my hand. We're going forward. We're going into battle. Okay? The Lord will go with us. Spiritual warfare would be a hopeless cause if we went on our own. Okay? But we are not on our own. We need to walk by faith in the Lord and not by sight. Isn't it amazing? What does Paul hear in this incredible letter and with four promises that we need to run the race successfully, like he did. These are things he learned, okay? The Lord will go with us. Matthew 28, 19. Jesus said, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Here it is. Here it is. As you go, and there are going to be challenges because we live in a hostile world. Remember, Satan is the god of this world, little g. He's the god of this world. That's what the Bible says. That's who you're opposing. Lo, Jesus said, lo, I am with you always, always, even unto the end of the world. He's with us. Okay? Isaiah 41.10. Wow. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. That's one of the most repeated phrases in all of Scripture. Fear not. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. His right hand is the place of power and honor. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, for we are laborers together with God. Isn't that great? Why can, why can my life count for something? Well, because God is going with me. That's why. It's not me. It's him. Just same with you. It's not you. It's him. Okay? God uses you in a great way to accomplish something. Praise him. Don't praise yourself. Praise him. He's the one who made the difference He's the one that brought it to path. By the way, you lead a soul to Christ, who does the saving? He does. Praise him for that. It's his message. So he goes with us. Number one, remember that. The Lord will go with us. Secondly, verse 17, the Lord will strengthen us. Do you see it? Verse 17, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. The Lord will strengthen us. Acts 1.8, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. 
And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and in the, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Notice we receive the power when the Holy when when you got saved, you received the Holy Spirit. The moment you got saved, He came to take up residence within you. We are sealed with and by the Holy Spirit of God. But He is not just living inside of our bodies; He is empowering us to live for Him. So, for a Christian not to live for Christ is a just simply a denial of the power that's in us. It's saying, "No, you know what? I I don't care. Not a big deal." Because we don't have to fail, folks. We can succeed. The Lord will strengthen us. Great hymn. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Listen, stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand in his strength alone. Do you get it? The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer, where duty calls or danger. Be never wanting there. Wanting there. That's King James terminology. Be never lacking there. If we stand up, put on the gospel armor, standing in his strength, we will never lack what we need to accomplish the work as we stand strong in these last days. Third, We see it again in verse 17. The Lord will deliver us. The Lord stands with us. We don't go alone. He strengthens us. And it says in verse 17, He will deliver us. The Bible Bible does not say what the lion here is. It could have been. Now think about it. It could have been a literal lion that Paul was going to be thrown to in Rome at the Colosseum, possibly. I'm not saying that's the case. I personally don't think it is, but I can't prove it. It could be Nero. Or it could be Satan. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be, vil- be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour Whether it's one of those three or someone else, here's the point. This is an important point today. Whatever the circumstances we find ourselves in, the Lord will deliver us in His time according to His plan. He has my life under control. Okay? might say, well, what if I get in a situation where where, um, uh, I... my life is in danger. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in just a moment. Let me show you this. Psalm 37, verse 39, 40. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. The salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. The Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Now, you know, somebody may look at the Apostle Paul and they may say, wait a minute, wait. Paul was about to die for his faith. What kind of deliverance is that? <laughs> My answer is a simple one it's the best kind. <laughs> it's the best kind. Look at verse 18. And the Lord shall deliver me. From every evil work, you notice verse 17, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, verse 18, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his uh, heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. He will deliver us, and not only that, number four, or D, the Lord will preserve us. It's in verse 18. He will preserve us. Now, this word preserve here, it's different than deliver, okay? It means to keep us safe, to keep us safe. Here's the point, and I think this is something we really need to meditate on. Nothing is ever going to happen to us that the Lord doesn't know about or allow. You have to believe that. These aren't just words on paper. 
the circumstances we go through, the things that happen to us, we didn't plan on it, and if we knew it was coming, we would do everything we could to stay away from it. But we find ourselves sometimes in the middle of something, a tremendous trial or testing in life, maybe a loss. God knew that. Can I say this? You don't get anything else, get this today. We will not die until he says it's time. Okay? You might say, well, I know I'm not going to die because I eat lots of oatmeal. <laughs> or I've got a vitamin regimen that's second to none. No, friend, let me tell you something. You may be in perfect physical shape, but when your time is up, you're going. And you may die in a perfectly healthy body, but when God says you're, you're going to die, you're going to die. He's the one who controls that. See, taking care of yourself, what does that do? Well, it's good, and we should do that. God says it's, it's profitable for to take care of ourselves. Why? It's just like taking care of your car. You don't want it always in a repair shop, right? You want it to start when it needs to start. You want it to get going. You want it to, to work properly. You, you don't want it crippled, so to speak, where it's not working properly. So what do we do? We take care of it. But the truth of it is this. Our bodies have a shelf life. God says, when it's time to go home, you're going home. But you're not going home until he says it's time to go home. That's the good news for the Christian soldier. We're not going home until he says it's time to go home. So, you know what's so exciting about that? We can be bold for the faith. We can stand up. We can serve the Lord. We can be public with our lives knowing this. Listen, he's preserving me. And I'm not going anywhere until he says it's time. Now, don't be dumb. Don't say, I'm invincible. I'm going to step out on the interstate in front of a Mac or a Mac truck or something like that. Well, that person died. They, they jumped out in front of a Mack truck on the interstate. Yeah. Well, what about that? Yeah. God says, you know what? You're so stupid, you're coming home. That's, that's what he said. <laughs> but isn't it even amazing some of the horrific accidents people are in and they still survive? Why? <laughs> Not time. Not time. Christian, listen, let's be bold in our faith, lovingly serve the Lord, because God says, you're not going anywhere until I say it's time. And by the way, wouldn't it be great if the time, he says, is the rapture of the church? And he says, it's time for all of you to come home now. Take me home, Lord. The Lord will preserve us. He preserves us in the here and now, which is what we've been talking about. What did David say in Psalm 23? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. A time of fellowship and peace and communion with God. There we are enjoying his fellowship, in, in a sense, supping with him, having, having a sweet time with the Lord and all the enemies are around us. They're going to get you. You ought to be afraid. You need to be scared. And we're just there. Lord, you're so good. This is just great. And they're all there. It's like, sorry, I'm enjoying my time with God too much to pay attention to you. Wow, what a way to live. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Number two, he preserves us for all eternity. Psalm 37, 28, the Lord loves judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever. You might say, does the Old Testament teach eternal security? I think that's a good one right there. The saints are preserved forever. You can't get any longer than that. Back to 2 Timothy 4. 
in verse 19. Salute Prisca and Aquila, or Priscilla and Aquila. Great couple who live for Christ together. And the household of Onesiphorus, who we have studied already. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. There are some things that happen to us, right? Do thy diligence to come before winter. Eubulus greeteth thee, Pudens and Linus. And no, I don't think Linus had a blanket. <laughs> and Claudia and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Grace be with you. Amen. See, all that, isn't it amazing? All that Timothy needed and all that he would ever really have to have is found in verse 22. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Okay. I want you to look at John chapter 3 with me. Turn there with me. John chapter 3. Now, you could be here today. You don't even have a Bible. You don't even know where things are in the Bible. That's totally fine. Folks, I hope you've benefited today from this so far. But what I have to tell you now is the most important part of this message. I want you to know before you ever get up today that you're going to heaven when you die. Based on what the Bible says. Because if you simply know because you've got your own idea... That's not going to get you into heaven. It's only God's way that brings salvation. So if you're here today and you're not sure where you're going when you die, maybe you're watching over the internet. Let me explain this to you, friend. God wants you to live with him forever in heaven. God is not a mean God. God does not send anybody to hell. As a matter of fact, he has done all the work, so you don't have to go there. He's done all he can do to keep you out of heaven. But the choice is yours. The choice is yours. Let me explain this to you. I'm going to illustrate it. If this hand represents you and me, we'll let my wallet represent all of our sin. We're all sinners. All of us are, including me. Yet God loves me. God loves us. He hates our sin, but he loves us. You see, you can't get to heaven with sin. It separates us. Heaven is a perfect place. There will be no sin in heaven. Therefore, if you went to heaven with your sin, you would be polluting it. Now, God says, no sin in heaven. Heaven's a perfect place. You have to be sinless to get in. Well, we've got a problem. We're sinners. And God says that sin brings with it a penalty. The wages of sin is death. If we die with our sin, we'll be lost forever in hell. By the way, there are no second chances once you die. No second chances. You need to decide today what you're going to do with Christ. Good works won't pay for sin. Death is the only payment. The Bible says you can try all you want. Try to be a good person, give money, get baptized, read your Bible, try to be a good Christian parent. Your works will not get you to heaven. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, it is not of works. It's not of works. You can't earn it. Listen, if you've got to be perfect, how are you going to earn it when you're already not perfect? If you have to be sinless and you're already a sinner, you're already disqualified. That's why you can't save yourself by your works. You need a payment for your sin, not a reformation or a cover-up in your life. So what are we going to do? There's nothing we can. Somebody, if somebody doesn't come to our rescue, we're sunk. That's where Jesus comes in. This hand representing him, the sinless Son of God. And when Jesus went to the cross... He took our sin upon himself, and he made the payment so we don't have to. He died in our place, paid for all of our sin of the entire life, and rose from the grave. And he says, if you will simply trust in him, put your faith in him, that he has made that payment for you the moment you do, he gives you everlasting life. All your sins are washed away. It's a gift. You can't earn it. It's a gift. You can have it today. Look at John 3.16. For God so loved the world... That includes you. It doesn't matter what you've done. God is willing to save you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, it's the only condition, should not perish but have everlasting life. 
everlasting. The moment you trust in him, he gives you everlasting life. If it's everlasting, it lasts forever. You can never lose it. If you can lose it, it's not everlasting. It's just common sense. So will you today, will you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you do, he'll give you everlasting life. If you don't trust in Christ, you're still lost in your sin. And if you die in that condition, you'll be lost forever. I urge you to trust in Christ as your Savior. You know, we have a rich heritage in our hymnal. And we'll bring back the hymnal, hopefully, sooner than later. One great treasure and very fitting to end on this series are these great lyrics. I'm just going to read them to you. We thought about singing it, but I just want you to think about it. Look at the words. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith. Where? In his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said? To you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. Fear not, I am with thee. Oh, be not dismayed. For I am thy God, I will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand. Upheld by my gracious, omnipotent, all-powerful hand. When through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of grief shall not thee overflow. For I will be with thee thy trials to bless and sanctify thee, or sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee. I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose. I will not, I will not desert to its foes. That soul, though all hell, should endeavor to shake. You ready for this? I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. powerful lyric. It's no wonder that Paul said, the Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Listen, if you've never trusted Christ, you need to do that today. There is no better solution. It's the only one to your sin. You're a sinner. You need a Savior. Jesus is him. Let's pray. Today, with every head bowed and every eye closed, please, no one looking around, I ask you today, friend, if you're here to put your faith in Jesus Christ, what else do I need to do? Nothing. You can't do anything else. You can't do anything else. You're helpless to save yourself. But he will save you. Would you trust in him right now in the quietness of your mind? Between you and God, he knows your thoughts. Just get that settled. You have the information today. Jesus died, paid for all your sins. For that payment to be good on your behalf, all you need to do is put your faith in Christ and he will give you eternal life. Would you do that today? Right now, right where you sit, would you do that today? Now, if today you've understood this for the first time and today you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'd love to pray for you. And in a moment, I'm just going to ask you to slip up your hand. You don't need to do that. It doesn't save you. It has nothing to do with getting you to heaven. It just lets, my know, it lets me know that today you trusted Christ and that you would like prayer. I won't embarrass you in any way. But if today you finally understood this and today you trusted Christ as Savior, could I pray for you? Is there anyone who would just slip up the hand and put it down saying, yes, today, I'm trusting Christ as my Savior. Would you pray for me? Is there anyone? Just slip it up, put it down. Is there anyone? Just slip it up, put it down. Raising your hand doesn't save you. 
just means you understood it, you'd like prayer. Is there anyone else? Anyone here? Friend, you may be watching over the internet. I urge you right now, would you put your faith in Jesus Christ to save you? You'll become his child the moment you do, and he's with you forever. What a glorious God we have. Father, thank you. Thank you for this wonderful, wonderful series, 2 Timothy. What a letter, soul-stirring, giving us courage, encouraging us in the faith, giving us clear teaching, doctrine, all the blessings that you give us. Thank you for each and every one. Thank you for each one here today, Father. Please work in each life, we pray. And Lord, if anyone has questions that they would feel free to come and ask, we'd be glad to help in any way. Thank you for your goodness. We look forward to seeing Jesus very soon. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Deliver us, Lord. But in the meantime, we will continue to share the gospel. We will unite with a united front as a church to please you and to honor you and to make you known. And we thank you for all your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.